Rather than looking at burnout, how can you look at ways to create an environment where you are efficient? A recent report suggests 50% of people, I mean, that's a lot, obviously, suffering from burnout. I think that's quite an alarming stat, actually. But, um, Andy, you work with a lot of very busy lawyers and advisors, so very high-pressure jobs, basically. Do you think they get the opportunity to switch off enough? Is the culture there within the, within the business? Uh, well, first of all, 50% is staggering. It's obviously, yeah. that's clearly an issue, right? Um, and I don't mean to... Uh, don't mean to pick on lawyers, but but um, it, 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 it's it's uh, I've worked within that sector for yeah. uh, or, or alongside that sector for a long time, and it's been well documented that mm. that, that that burnout is a problem within in the legal world and also like you say any high pressure job. Mm. Um, it, I think it's not a case of do they get the opportunity; they've got to make the opportunity. Yeah. You, you can't rely on someone else to 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 be given it. You've got to go and you've got to take that opportunity. Because if you don't switch off, if yeah. you don't unplug, whatever, you know, it can be really simple. You're just making life very hard for yourself. But maybe we do need to catch up a bit culturally. I know in Japan they have little sleep pods in, in some very big sort of tech businesses, for instance, where they yeah. encourage you to go and have 30 minutes to switch off. I mean, I'd be in favour of that. But <laughs> yes, as you say, easier said than done when we've all got a stack of emails, you know, very busy schedules and so on. But what are perhaps the first signs that somebody might be about to reach that? That burnout point, would you say? I don't think either either Paul, Paul or I are necessarily the right, right people to yeah, talk about a huge yeah. amount of depth. But um, uh, I, th I think let's look at it from a from a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than waiting till someone's experiencing burnout, and there's a range of different levels of burnout and a range of symptoms, let's look at what we can do to to reduce the chances of it. Yeah. And essentially, if if you're permanently distracted, if you're switching from task to task. You're not efficient. You're making life really hard for yourself. Mm. And, and I don't think we're necessarily doing any more than we ever did. It just feels like it. Mm. So I would say, let, rather than looking at burnout, how can you look at ways to create an environment where you are efficient? Yeah. Um, just like putting little rules in place and sort of no phone after or this, that, or the other, or limiting your screen time. And Yeah, I mean, I've spoken to Simon before. He's got a lockbox where he puts all his digital stuff in for a couple of hours if he needs to be creative. And, and, yeah, um, yeah that I sort know. Of thing. It's so true. My brain, when it rests on holidays, suddenly you get all your best ideas sometimes, isn't it? Because you've actually rested the brain. Yeah, and, and, and flow uh, is um, quite a new term for me, probably mm -hmm. for a lot of people. It feels a little bit out there sometimes. Yeah. I'm... I would. I'm trying to personally create something that's just a stepping stone to flow. Okay. Because it feels like maybe a bridge too far sometimes for me conceptually to, okay. to achieve. Um, but that is just cutting out distractions. And and, and uh, the, my first experience of how effective that can be. And, and Simon talks about the fact that they did a study on how uh, executives can increase their efficiency by 500%. Wow. Right. So I, I'm not. I haven't done that. But during COVID, when all the kids weren't at school. And neither half and I had full time jobs, uh, so we, we couldn't do that normal eight hours. Mm. I wasn't sleeping, as a lot of people didn't. I would wake up at four or five and start working. Mm. And in that period, from you know until nine a.m., I would get a day's work done. Done, yeah. Because I wasn't Focused. distracted, and it just yeah. goes back to that. I mean, it's, it's a sort of a, a level of flow, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more in depth uh, with you um, uh, about flow. Um, because it's really, really interesting. So how do you think we best get into this flow state? I think you might have a slide for us or something. Yeah, well, yeah. I've got a little experiment. We'll put a slide up now, but let me explain it before we set the slide off. I'm obviously very interested as a, someone interested in behavioural science in how the human mind does and doesn't work. Mm. And one of the things you find is your, your mind plays tricks. But the flip side of this idea your mind plays tricks is actually the smallest cues can change the narrative. And so when we start to talk about flow, what are the cues that we can get into flow? So flow being a calm state. Yes, it? yes, and, and basically effortlessly being able to do stuff okay. and enjoying it. And almost time, you don't have a sense of time and you start to really almost just sort of feel you're part of the thing. So sports mm. people get it quite a lot as well. I mean, when they're playing well, but from a work point of view. So let me just try this experiment with the slide. Before the slide starts going, let me tell you what's going to happen. There, You should be able to see two cubes on the, on the slide, mm -hmm. and they're stationary at the moment. Now, in a second, and not yet, they will start to move. But actually, they never move at all. All they do is flash on and off. They flash on and off. 
and your mind will simply think they're moving because of what's happening to the arrows in the middle. So let's set it off now and see what you think the cubes are doing. Oh, hmm. yes, it does look like they're moving. How bizarre. So that's my brain sort mm. of playing tricks. This is my favourite one now. Ooh, that is moving, isn't it? No? <laughs> All they're doing is flashing on and off. Ooh. And this is, for me, an example of, of the power of the human mind. Mm. And the smallest, as I say, the smallest cues are changing the narrative. Now, now, I think this has relevance to what we're talking about, because if one is trying to, to get into flow, if you like, one mm. is trying to change one's behaviours, one's trying to behave one's attitude, change one's attitudes uh, to, say, the perma-crisis, yeah. there, there are definitely things you can do. So you mentioned things like sleep. Clearly, that's very important to yeah. refreshing and regenerate the brain. We, we know about diet and exercise. All the, these are all really good things. Mm. And, you know, people know this, whether they do them or not, it's another matter. Um, regular breaks. There's a very interesting psychological experiment done by an Italian psychologist in the 80s called the Pomodoro experiment. He was Italian. Yeah. And, tomato. Um, tomato. And it, you know why? Because he had a tomato timer. And he worked out that 25 to 30 minutes of hard work is absolutely fine. Then you should take a break, five right. to 10 minutes and then go back to it. Now again, this sounds like a sort of trivial thing, but it works. Mm. The, the science proves this kind of thing helps you with your creativity, helps you with your, your flow. And not to be underestimated, these little psychological tips and tricks that you can do yeah. to get into flow. Interesting. And sort of, do you think we all have varying degrees of resilience or is resilience something that you can work on to, to combat sort of our everyday life and be sort of strong to be able to go, right, I'm yeah. going to do this now, I'm going to put that away, because I think everyone can get a bit overwhelmed yeah. sometimes. It's not just about sort of resilience in the sort of the, the, the macho sense of the word, mm. it's about a mental awareness that there's good and bad. There will always be tough times in your life. And indeed, part of <coughs> part of any sort of the studies, the psychological studies into things like happiness and satisfaction, be not just you must go and search for unhappiness, but you must em embrace challenges when they come. Uh, it, sometimes if you can treat them like a game, that can be a very helpful way of doing it. Um, I'm always reminded of the story about resilience, and this kind of ties into the talk about investment, actually. There's a story that sometimes is attributed to Mark Twain, which I rather like. Uh, he was... Um, all the best quotes. Yeah, all the best quotes, but <laughs> I don't think he had anything to do with the story. But anyway, and it links in with the investment bit, but it actually links in with, with this bit, which is the idea of, of play the longer game, mm -hmm. which obviously resilience is part of. And the story goes that he was traveling in the, um, the Midwest somewhere and he came across into a small town and he saw some uh, sort of gang of boys uh, bullying a little boy. And he sort of went and stepped in, well, what's wrong? Why are you laughing at this kid? Why are you sort of mocking him? And they said, Mr. Mr. He, he played, watch this game we play with him. And the, the, the sort of leader of the bullies held up two coins and, and one was a, a valuable coin and one was a not valuable coin. And they said, watch this, mister, watch how stupid he is. Uh, and then they turned to the little boy and said, which one do you want? Mm. And the little boy looked at them and said, I want this one here. Okay. And they all laughed because it was, the, it was yeah. the less value coin. And uh, they ran off. And Twain or whoever came up with the story said to the little boy after they'd gone, he said, they can be a bit silly there. They offer you a choice of a, yeah. it was a nickel or a dime in, in actual fact. And you took the, uh, the least, expensive one. Uh, why do you do that? And the little boy wiped away his tears and said, but mister, if I didn't take the, the little, little one, they wouldn't play that game with me every day. Oh, okay. So there's resilience, yeah. there's investing for the long term, albeit mm. in a slightly unethical, but it's making a serious point here. Stick yeah. around. It goes back to this winning the losers game argument. Yeah. You stick around, yeah. be there for tomorrow. So that's a future entrepreneur right there. Definitely. And, and, <laughs> and it shows resilience as well. Yeah. And I yeah. Think, so it can, I think it's quite a useful little story. Very nice indeed. Right, wonderful. Well, I've really enjoyed our chat. Unless there's anything else that you would like to, to end with, I think that's probably it. So I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. But thank you so much to our wonderful guests and, of course, to you for watching. And we'll see you next time on the Nedbank Private Wealth Investment and Wealth Insights Report. Take care.